Hey guys, it's Erin Wathen of Erin Wathen Wellness, and I'm here with my friend Pam Byrne to discuss autoimmune diseases, living with them, and we thinking of food as medicine. So thank you, Pam. Hi guys. So Pam, how do you and I know each other anyway? We know each other from a spin studio in town. Or no, no, we know each other from from years ago doing a nutritional supplement shake. Yes. Each other. Yes. Yes. That, yes. <laughs> and I was a leader and you were one of the challenge challenges on our challenge group. Yeah. And that's where I met. I never lost wow, any weight. Blast. <laughs> What's that? I never lost any weight. And every single time my goal was to stop um, the food drama. <laughs> totally. Hey, but the best part was getting to know me. So it was worth no, it. I every single way I was like, I want to stop the food drama. I want to stop the food drama. <laughs> And the food drama did not stop. And then I like, and then when I, when I, um, my book was the first version of my book, it was like how to stop the food drama. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, I never lost any weight with that stuff. Oh, so, so sorry to hear that sister. Period. Well, I mean, pyramid scheme, who knew? Um, so yeah. yeah, that's how you and I know each other. And then we did a business together and, you know, on and on and on. So Let's hear about like your story. Like, how did you get involved with health coaching and not selling that stuff any longer? Mm -hmm. All the good stuff. Well, my story, it's, it's a long one, but it can be shortened. <laughs> um, and I'll shorten it for everybody's sake. But after the birth of my second child, I got really, really sick. And um, when I say I got really sick, I wasn't necessarily in bed all day, every day, but I just felt awful. I felt lethargic um, and I felt like something was wrong. I also stopped getting my period right away. And after the, my son was born, my first child, I had a normal cycle. Everything was fine, like right after his birth. So I knew from my cycle and it took a full year of every gynecologist in the book, every doctor in the book. I tried two holistic practitioners um, and then one zany, I don't even know what he was, but he practiced functional medicine in a sense. And that said, you know what, maybe we should do a celiac test um, because I'd started to lose a little weight, which was, was so bloated um, and nothing was really, nothing was really happening. Um, otherwise in terms of my cycle. So he was the one that thought to do a celiac test after, seeing 11 doctors he thought about and he was not a medical doctor and the celiac test came back with flying colors that I had it and to be honest this was about eight years ago I really didn't know much about celiac uh, we I had a friend of my husband's one of my husband's friends had gotten diagnosed with it and I thought it was kind of a like a scam or a ploy um, I thought he was looking for attention and just wanted to lose weight so we all realized that that's not true celiac does exist people um <laughs> So I started going gluten-free, which was really hard. Eight years ago, things were a lot different. Restaurants, there was not as much gluten-free stuff available. Yeah, 2010, and, yeah. What was really yeah. 2010, like health-wise? I'm trying to remember. Like, what was, was that? what was big in 2010 health-wise? You know what? I don't even know what was. I'm trying to think of what it, I think the protein thing. I think the low sugar. I don't really. The, the whole gluten-free, keto. You know paleo um, hadn't hit yet, had it? Paleo had a hit. And to be honest, I think maybe like a little bit of Atkins was still in there. Okay. Okay. Um, but that's a really good question. I eat paleo and all of those things have really had not hit yet. So even going to whole food challenge and things were not listed gluten-free. Um, the gluten-free stuff wasn't readily available and you really had to search if something was gluten-free. So back then it was a challenge, but I felt so much better, um, after going on it. And and to be quite honest, what happened the first few months of going gluten-free is that I gained a lot of weight. And the reason being is that my body was finally absorbing nutrients for the first time. That's one reason. That's what the doctors say. The other reason is, is I went to town with every gluten-free <laughs> junk food product available. Over all I could. What's that? Overcorrected. Yes, way overcorrected. <laughs> I would look at my family and all the chocolate chip cookies they were eating and the pizza, and I bought everything that was the same that they were eating for me, yet I was the only one eating it. So that was kind of a problem. But once I, once I figured that one out, and you know, what I found too is that 
you really have to source out good gluten-free foods. Um, a lot of them are just as much junk as the regular gluten foods, if not more, because they're over supplementing with different ingredients. Um, so with the celiac diagnosis, I also got diagnosed with another autoimmune disease called scleroderma. It's kind of within the lupus family. It's a mixed con connective tissue disease. And for anybody that's familiar with it, it can be a really, really scary disease to look up. So who's ever watching, don't look it up. Um, and what it does is it affects your heart and lungs. And so the um, disease can harden your heart and your lungs. You can lose mobility, not be able to walk. It can also turn your skin. Um, you can get what's called sclerodactyly, where your hands can be like this. They just, your skin kind of turns a little bit to rock. Um, getting that diagnosis was a huge blow to the system. I figured I had enough going on with two young children and trying to get back as, you know, in terms of healing myself from celiac and still figure out why I wasn't having normal menstrual cycle. Um, so with the autoimmune disease, I had to go on a ton of different medicines and everybody has their own path with autoimmune. Um, mine was I think very similar to a lot of people in the sense that I saw just about every doctor there was. Some believed the diagnosis, some had a different diagnosis, but everybody did agree that there was some inflammation there and that there was autoimmune. Um, after a few years of being on some pretty nasty medicines, two that wound me up in the hospital, um, two different oral chemotherapies, uh, a number of different um, medicine that would kind of shut down my autoimmune system, I realized that my body was not reacting well. I was actually worse when I was on the medicines. And I kind of had a light bulb moment. Um, I was coming home. I, my children were very young and I used to get really ill in the winter time. That's when my skin would be affected. I'd get big rashes and I just would not feel well. And I was coming home from my doctor at hospital, a special surgery in New York City. And I drove 45 minutes home in rush hour, got home to my two young kids and I went straight to the wine cabinet and poured myself a bottle of wine, or poured my, not a bottle, <laughs> poured myself a glass of wine and reached for the chocolate. The Freudian slip there, yeah. Kind of, what's that? No Freudian slip there. Yeah, a little Freudian slip. Maybe it was a bottle. I don't know. Maybe it was a bottle. Um, so I reached for the wine and I reached for the chocolate the second I got in the door. And I just thought to myself, wait a minute. Yeah. Maybe this is why I'm inflamed. And it was just like that. I was on the phone with CVS getting another refill of prednisone to calm the inflammation. And it just hit me. I don't feel well. I can't, you know, do the dishes, tie my children's shoes. My fingers are so inflamed and they're in so much pain and like that. And, you know, you would have thought that having had to refine my diet already with celiac, that I would have been somewhat in tune what was good and what was bad. But it was a self-soothing mechanism that I had to realize over time that was just not soothing me. It was not treating my body well. Yeah. And and I think we can all relate to that, right? Yeah. And it was really interesting to me since I cleaned up my diet for different reasons, but still had to clean up my diet, was how many doctors never ask you what you're eating. They're just like, it's fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, it's been all these cavities from how much sugar I was consuming and all the diet Coke. Like mm -hmm. I mean, how many like 40 year olds are getting cavities, but they were just drilling them. And then I was getting like cyst, like cystic acne, which is very unusual to just start cropping up in like a 35 year old. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll just put steroids in it. But there was never any like, what's going on in your life or what are you eating and drinking? I mean, now I know like when your blood sugar rises and you're, I mean, all the sugar, all the blood in your body, it gets raised up, lower. That's inflammation. Yep. Disease is inflammation. So that's why my skin was so bad. So, but we're not going to talk about that. We're just going to sell you a thousand dollar laser treatment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, exactly. There's a lot of that kind of like, Let's let, let's just ignore the problem. Let's fix the symptom stuff. I felt like with a lot of these doctors, and like you, I was in Manhattan seeing all these very expensive doctors when a trip to the grocery store was really what was needed. Mm -hmm. Eliminate the crap, stay out of the middle of the store, and just hang out on the rails. Like that's really what was needed. That's that's it. That's the medicine. And I think that's the beauty of what you and I both do, being health coaches and holistic nutritionists is that the first thing that we were taught in school 
Um, and the first thing that we do with clients as we've worked together is get to the root of the problem. Like before you tell me anything, tell me what your diet is, what your habits are, what your shortcomings are, and then, you know, really get to the root of the problem, whether it's emotional, whether it's eating, because it is all affected. And I think it's so disheartening that none of these doctors, um, even my rheumatologist who I love to death, you know, I've asked about different foods and now I know, but I kind of asked too, just to see what the response is. And there's really still no talk of, you know, diet or food affecting my autoimmune disease Isn't or others. Crazy for your, room, your rheumatologist. Like my that. rheumatologist. And, you know, what I, and I'm not sure if you've seen this, I've seen way too many doctors, even at the Mayo Clinic, the, the doctors tend to have a response, you know, I, well, I'm a medical doctor. I, I don't really know too much about nutrition. That's not in my field. You could, could see a nutritionist yeah. about that. So that is always really sad to me. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and that's why I do what I do now. That's why I, you know, had to turn to holistic nutrition. You've got to get out there and help the people that are these poor people. And I see some of my clients that were where I was years ago, six years ago, you know, just can't get out of bed. And they're going to doctor to doctor and their CVS bill is getting bigger and bigger with each prescription. <laughs> and it's just nothing's happening. And I'm so glad, you know, that health coaching and, you know, integrative and holistic nutrition is becoming a thing now because it truly wasn't really thought of as a thing, let alone a credible thing a few years ago. Yeah, no, I agree. I think with all this awareness of, you know, what are you, what are you eating? What do you, what, you know, and also stress and lifestyle. And um, it's, it's just more of just integrative, holistic, just the whole picture because we're not just one thing and you can't just mm -hmm. give a pill for your entire system being out of whack. And I was just in, I have, you know, I have a 13 year old and I was in the car with her this morning and she was talking about like her skin, which by the way, in the scope of teenage, it's pretty darn good. Like a one. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, as perfect as she'd like it to be. And I was talking to her. I'm like, well, honey, just like drink more water. Like, and she's, a very good eater. Like she used to be pretty bad. Like I was a little concerned there for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, like she just eat a block of cheese. <laughs> oh God. Does kind of sound good. But yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, whatever, but she, because she, for a lot of reasons, she's not doing that any stuff anymore. But what's crazy is I was the dermatologist yesterday for myself and she asked me about Moira and I was telling her like, look, her skin's gotten so much better since she started seeing you. And it's just like topical stuff. It's nothing major. And just her habits, like after she works out or does practice, she, I bought her like some wipes from the drugstore and she just gets all the oil off of her face or she's a headband. So a lot of doesn't even touch her face. Like every time mm -hmm. her face, she washes her hands, like a lot of habits. So she doesn't have the acne and then a lot of like other habits, like what she's eating. So her mm -hmm. so inside out and outside in that all cause or do not cause the problem. But when I was talking to my dermatologist, he was saying that, you know, they get absolutely zero nutrition training in medical school and it's an elective, which I knew, but mm -hmm. I mean, we all know that, but when you think about how it's crazy, but also like the drug reps, they, I mean, if you've ever gone to a doctor, like first thing in the morning, that's when the drug reps are there and they have mm -hmm. donuts and coffee and they cut you off. Mm -hmm. they that, right. So they don't get a kickback from Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. They get a kickback so from everybody, the prednisone people. Right. So prednisone can work wonders like short term, but it's mm -hmm. also one of those things where it's like, what do we do? long term because you can't be on prednisone the whole time like your liver your liver will implode <laughs> it's yeah and your bones will turn to paper and, and your yeah. face will like will be too big for your the skin over it like I mean, it's really yeah. scary i had to go on steroids I, when i had allergic so reaction right. i had allergic reaction to like a face cream in january and i had to go on prednisone for like five days and i felt like my skin was like coming out of my like yeah, it was horrible. And that was like five days. 
So I can't yeah. imagine just a lifetime of on and off prednisone. Oh my gosh. You know, and that brings up such a good point that, you know, sometimes like these things are necessary. I mean, sometimes you totally. have to, you have to be on, you know, a really intense drug and that's just the only way it's going to happen. But I think one of the things that frustrates me with the medical field, and I'm not saying that every doctor is like this. I know there are some that are not, but is that there's no sourcing out the problem. What else could I do in, you know, junction with putting, you know, getting put on medicine and, yeah. and, you know, to see, I was fascinated. You know, I'd been healthy my entire life up until the time I turned about 34 and really had never been on anything except antibiotics, no surgeries, no, no nothing. And I, I guess I was just fascinated to see that all these strong medicines, I think I've been on about 16 different meds for the autoimmune. Um, so fun. And everyone had some little trigger that made another part of my body worse, whether it was my liver. Um, I had costs, I like had like a swelling of like the heart. I had my rib cage. Um, I mean, little things, you know, and, or I would just feel even, I was feeling tired already, but then I would feel 10 times worse. And that's what I found with the oral chemos Then the nausea and they were just awful. And, you know, again, is we kind of, you were just mentioning, I mean, the only medicine that has worked for me is food. And again, that does not go for everybody that's got autoimmune disease. I, I, I needed those medicines in the beginning and I definitely needed steroids, um, for a little bit to bring that inflammation down. But over time it is food. It comes down to food. And I think you and I are both so in tune with it that, you know, you can even see in terms of food, like my mood, I, I was really depressed then and rightfully so, you know, two small kids, very, very sick, not knowing what's going on. But I know now too, like if I eat the wrong thing, you know, the next day I wake up on the wrong side of the bed Totally. and it's just, you know, it's, it's the gut. It, it Everything affects you in the mood, you know, and what over time, you know, it's just turned to, and I'm sure you're pretty similar that m my plate is like a lot of vegetables and not everybody has to eat all vegetables, but then, then you fill in the other stuff and it's not all boring. And I do eat sugar, but you know, it's totally changed that I used to, you know, nibble on the kids candy day after day, you know, post Halloween. Yeah. It literally has, and I'm not just saying this as a, you know, somebody in the nutrition field, it has zero interest to me. I would rather have like a huge spoonful of almond butter or peanut butter or like, you know, something else, something filling. And I think that that's the beauty of it that, you know, you can go to the grocery store. I was at this store today and a lady stopped me because I pretty much went to Trader Joe's and I took my arm and just like put every vegetable like in and then I went straight to the cash register and not every trip is like that. And I think the older lady was just kind of wondering what I was going to do with it. And I told her I was going to eat it. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the gig now is that, you know, you fill that majority of with some great veggies and it doesn't have to be steamed broccoli and, you know, and great foods and meats and all of that. And that will slowly over time heal you and make you so much happier. Yeah, I know the mood thing is interesting as well because um, when I was talking to Moira in the car, because all I do is drive kids around, and we were talking about she stopped eating pasta because it's her school. There's they they have food like I mean it's like the food is actually decent, um, which is interesting because it's private school, so of course it should be it should be decent, right? Um, and also I don't like making lunches, so it works out, but yeah. they both. They're like, they always have a pasta bar, like a panini bar. And they always have like something hot and it's actually pretty good. Cause they've introduced food to my kids. I would never make, I would never think to make like gyros. Like it would never have been like on my rotation, but my kids will now eat them if we go out to Greek food. So it's kind of worked out. But she was saying that last year because um, her then best friend will only eat white food. I mean, that's not her actual like term, but she's like a cheese and white carb person. Mm -hmm. Her old, like the girl she was really tight with last year, but they don't really hang out that much anymore. So now she's eating salads every day because she doesn't even going over to the pasta bar anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting how those habits, like the physical not walking over there with your friend impacts change everything yeah and so she and I said 
you know, people that eat a lot of processed food and high quick acting carbohydrates have a higher rate of depression. She was like, they do. And I said, yeah, because you know, if you think about it, your, your mood, your blood sugar goes up, your mood is elevating, it crashes just as quickly. And then what do you do? Do you have more or do you just stay with a lower? I said, it's, it's kind of sugar in the egg kind of thing. But I was telling her, I said, there's not a lot of people that accomplish a lot that eat tons of pizza. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and she was, and I said, such and a good point. True. I'm like, there's not a lot of high achievers that I've met who live off of crap. They just mm -hmm. don't. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so she's like, I, I never heard that before. I'm like, well, you're in the eighth grade. But, <laughs> you know, but yeah. it's like, if you want to get more out of your work day, if you want to not be a grump, it really doesn't serve you to like eat Snickers bars all the time. It doesn't. And the thing is, it's like that, I, that instant gratification is so instant and then that's it. And so fleeting. Yeah. And that's the thing. It is. It is an instant. And that's all it is because like within like 15 minutes, like your blood sugar is sort of, and even a Snickers bar, which is like the better choice. Like I was mm -hmm. traveling and I was in Ohio a couple of weeks ago. There was some morning show and they were having the usual, well, well if you have to eat something, what do you pick mm -hmm. conversation? Which I always know what they're going to say. They're going to say, go for a Snickers mm -hmm. because the pro because the nuts will slow down the blood sugar absorption yeah. and the gummies will stick in your teeth and give you cavities. Which yeah. is true, mm -hmm. but it's still like, I mean, first of all, it's like the grossest GMO, Monsanto, whatever, but yeah. it's the whole need. It's the need word in there. Mm -hmm. I don't like. <laughs> that's the because you don't need it. You need something else. And that's what you and I do is we dig deeper. Like, what are you really needing? And to yeah. be honest, sometimes you do need maybe like a little chocolate. Like maybe sometimes you need to have treat yourself in some way, you know, and you're really craving something, but the overall, like, you know, all day, every day and, and, you know, binging on junk food, it's going to end not well. And then it's going to re recur again and again and again. Yeah, no, I used to have sugar in the console of my car <laughs> when my kids are really little. The gummy bears. The gummy bears. I've heard that story. Oh yeah. No. I mean, it was, it was not like, it was not like a, and like a one off. It was yeah. just like how life was because it was like when they were really, I'm talking like preschool age. Like, yeah. I remember just feeling like to get, to get to the end of the day, like to just the relief when like everybody was asleep, like just yeah. walking down my stairs, being like, oh God, I can, now it's my time. So bring on Ben yeah. and Jerry because they were like my buds. Totally. But that's, I mean, I don't think that way. I don't act that way. That isn't my life anymore. And now they go to bed so much later. It's really annoying. But that those so years are just so brutal. And it's yeah. all, it's just such a different time. But when we have that mindset of like, I deserve ice cream because my day was hard. Yeah. Let's think of the first part of that sentence and just think about our thoughts about it. And yeah. you don't like food. I, I just, I just always tell my clients like food is a neutral, like food isn't a, you shouldn't be scared of food. You shouldn't love food. Food is food. Food is food. Like, food is fuel. Food is necessary. Like, do you, mm -hmm. do you live in fear of air? Do you live in fear of water? Do you have, like, you know, and I, and I really feel like the foodie movement is almost a problem because there's so many people, like, I miss a foodie. I miss a foodie. I'm like, and body acceptance, I also have a huge issue with because there's a lot of really bad things that are happening with body acceptance as the overarching excuse i'm like no, no 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 body acceptance means you accept like your frame for what it is mm -hmm. your genetics what they are like i'm never going to be six feet tall i'm five seven that's just how it is if i was hating my body and living in this like self-loathing pit because i'm never going to be six feet tall and that's just not fair all day that's that's mm -hmm. not accepting my body but me adding a hundred pounds to my frame because I, I love my curves is setting myself up for chronic disease, shortening my lifespan, my day-to-day -day life will be considerably harder. Mm -hmm. That's not accepting my body. Mm -hmm. And I feel like all these body acceptance lies that are getting told are, are just really problematic. 
And I know that's terribly unpopular when I say that. It's like that and saying I think keto isn't <laughs> the end all be all. But I don't think the body acceptance movement, as people, as a lot of like people see it, see it, it yeah. It's not, I mean, that is not helpful. Like, if you're, I mean, not everyone is going to be like Tom Brady's wife, Giselle. Like, that is just not who most people are built. But that doesn't. Even Giselle isn't going to be Giselle. She's recently up, you know, opened up about, you know, all yeah. that. And also the thing with her is like physically she's one thing, but mentally she was not who we thought she yeah. was, right? Which is cool. Everybody everybody has problems. But you know, when you see like these these posters and all this stuff online about like it, people that are you know, their BMI is way past obese mm-hmm. and I love the cur I love the skin I'm in. I'm like, you don't have to not like yourself to be healthy. Like getting your BMI to a healthy range to lower your risk of chronic disease. I don't think that's self-loathing at all. You're extending your life. You're you're putting less strain on your organs. Exactly. So I that that kind of, that and the foodie thing. I feel like with foodie, it's like it's all these people that are obsessing about food and you know obsessing about you know everything they're going to put in their mouth, and then it's. They have this level of sophistication behind it, yeah. which is cool. Like, I'm not saying you should hate the food you eat, but when it's like a social accepted movement and then it's still people gorging. Yeah, <laughs> no, like, it is. The food is still it's entertaining. Exactly. It's entertainment. And I think that that's the problem with society too, is in dealing with clients and that, that food is just food. And there also has to be some level of moderation and balance. You know, it can't be all, you know, all food all the time, all the junk food or nothing. Like no food restriction, any of any of that. And I think that that's what the, you know, the foodie mi- movement in terms of Instagram and all of that stuff. You know, you see the huge milkshake with a big piece of cake. I mean, it's the bigger, the bigger, the better. Um, and that's really a problem. And I know I have clients that really struggle with, what they call food porn in the sense of like the food network and all the Instagram shops. And it kind of gets them going like, okay, this is the norm. Well, that's just me treating myself like a piece of birthday cake on sure. Like, you know, try it, but that is not like an everyday occurrence. And that's, that's not the norm. And, and your body's going to rebel from that. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that. Um, Cause it was my daughter's birthday party the other day and she wanted to go to the sugar factory in the city. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which, which I think might be my new definition of hell on earth. Um, I can understand. Have you been there? I haven't. We've stayed away from it so far. But I, I, but I have to say, I'm, I kind of want to go. Well, I'm just. I, I mean, it definitely go. is like it. It is a psychological, social phenomenon of what's going on. But they do have the milkshakes with like the piece of cake and the Twinkie, mm-hmm. and they have these cauldrons of juice syrup thing with dry ice with gummy worms and it's completely normalizing this just awful food Mm -hmm. but it is food porn but i think some people are much more interested in than others i mean like my kid it's like i don't i think because food's always been kind of neutral they're not fascinated by it um Mm -hmm. and for me i just find it like like just so unappealing but I was watching the people around me and there were people that were consuming that stuff. Yeah. They really were like, yeah. I mean, they were eating the entire like wedge of cake and that was stuck <laughs> on a on giant toothpick the into the milkshake and the Twinkie, you know, and then sucking down them. And, and, and what's interesting is in the outside of the frosted glass, they managed to stick candy. I don't know how these things occur, but it yeah. is a very extreme way to be. But how do you very, stop? Like, how do you live your daily life? Like, how do you eat? Well, and that's such a good question. And, and that's the one thing that I try to promote um, to all my clients that everybody, everybody, their body is different. You know, my, my, what works with me is not necessarily what works with you. Yeah. And in terms, you know, it's been slowly over time. It's not like I had this light bulb go off, you know, said, okay, I've got to cut out all the bad stuff. I mean, it's taken years and it just kind of, I naturally, as I said, I, 
I eat mostly vegetables. I do eat animal protein. I pretty much eat everything, but I do stay obviously from gluten and dairy and corn. And I cannot emphasize enough whether you have celiac disease or whether you have any form of autoimmune, which is chronic inflammation, to get your your food sensitivities checked out. And I'm not saying these these are I don't have an allergic reaction to milk or to to dairy or to corn, but my body does not react well. And you know, popcorn is like one of my all time favorites, and it's considered a healthy snack. And when I first went gluten free, I mean, that was like my go to, and it always has been my go to. Um, but after getting, after realizing like something's not right the day after eating corn or a corn product, which so many gluten free products are filled with corn as the base, um, my stomach and indigestion and and kind of like nasal sinusy thing would kind of act up, and nothing nothing crazy, but I just wouldn't feel a hundred percent. And so I did have my food sen- sensitivities checked, and I've done that every other year. I just go to my gastroenterologist. You can also go to a functional medicine doctor um, and to check those, check those um, sensitivities out. Because if you do have chronic inflammation, your gut is somehow compromised and it's so important. So I really eat everything, but I stay away from the gluten, the dairy and the corn. And when I tell people that they're kind of like, well, what do you eat? I mean, you name it, you know, our fridge is full. I, I, I eat everything and I, and I do really appreciate the, the piece of chocolate and I do appreciate indulging once in a while. Um, but naturally my tastes have just kind of gone to the less processed. I mean, you know, unless it's eating a vegetable out of a bag, there's very few things I eat out of a bag. And that's not to say that I don't crave potato chips or something like that, or French fries once in a while, but I just know how my body feels. And what I've noticed is that my cravings, come from, I, I, what I do crave is fat. So whether that's in the form of like, you know, a meat product or like nuts, that is the one true craving after whittling all the other stuff out that I can see that all those times that I like reach for chocolate or sugar or something, I was really craving some sort of fat to like satiate and tie me up. Those cravings are pure protein. I think what has helped me recover and get off all the meds is being in tune as to what I'm needing at that moment, you know? And if, mm-hmm. if I'm needing a second lunch at two o'clock, cause I'm still hungry and I'm really craving protein without the eggs, you know, and it's, it's going with your intuition, which can be hard in, in today's society because my clients are like, well, I'm supposed to eat at eight, 1030, 1230. And it's yes. And maybe that works for some people, but you really got to go with how your body is feeling. Maybe you don't need that morning snack, you know, that mid morning snack. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe you are like I am, I eat an enormous lunch. You know, most of the time I'm alone because the kids are at school and I'm working. Um, the trough that I have, you might be <laughs> offended, but that's just the way my body is. And I eat an enormous lunch and then, you know, lighter breakfast, lighter dinner. Um, but I go with how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I definitely always eat a bigger lunch. I'm always not, I'm not really hung. I that hungry that morning. I definitely experimented with intermittent fasting. Like one of my friends was doing a challenge group and I was like, yeah, sure. I'll be part of your challenge group. And that I found interesting because like your client, I grew up, you know, with a fat free nineties where we can never be hungry. Right. We snacking is good. Yeah. And keeps the metabolism going, yada, yada. Yeah. But for me, it was an excuse to just graze all day, all the time. Um, much like a cow. So to have, to have those, you know, just not eating after dinner, life changing. And then in the morning to not eat before I worked out, I thought was going to be just a non-starter. And then I realized if I have, you know, cause I'm lactose intolerant, some sort of like coconut cream or almond cream, whatever in my coffee, I'm actually good until like 1130. I usually have an early lunch. Um, so I found that to be very helpful, which I would have never thought would have worked with me, but mm-hmm. I just, I'm like, I'll try it. But what's interesting is I have helped people with intermittent fasting as they want to try it. And then people think that what it means is you can just eat whatever you want for eight hours window. Yeah. And so like, there's a, so much confusion out there about like, what everybody should be eating. What is, you know, what the, what keto is because it ends up being a lot of keto keto brownies and then they go on like dirty keto Facebook groups 
where it's all about like pork rind nachos. So there's so much like just manipulation of real health information out there, which I think is yes, I agree. problematic for so many people who have really good intentions. They might not have a lot of knowledge and they get sidetracked because they're like, oh, I like, I like pork rind nachos. <laughs> they're over here in the weeds when, like you said, like you eat a lot of vegetables. Like that's kind of the basics. Like I always think of like when people ask me like, what do you think about this, this diet or this trend? I just always say like, there are some like almost like, cl like little black dresses, like classics that never go out of style. Cause yeah. you're like, well, no one knows what to eat. It's always, it's always the changing stuff. I'm like, no, they're not. They're just saying you can't drink gallons of coconut oil. Cause the mm -hmm. people that were doing that, it didn't end well, but it, 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 they never should have been doing it in the first place. Anything in excess is, is yeah. never good. And I, and you know, and I also do feel like that's really controversial to say, and I will be honest, I, I don't agree necessarily with a keto diet unless you're doing it for medical reasons, which a lot of people have to do. And yeah. I've seen huge success with that in terms of epilepsy and other, other medical reasons. I've seen huge success with keto, but I mean, the, all of these diets, I mean, if you are just narrowing and focusing in it, it doesn't always, um, cutting out too many food groups doesn't always end well. And, and that in itself can lead to inflammation when you're, when you're getting, um, too much of one product. And, and that's what celiac people with celiac often have an issue with because you are so restricted to certain foods. That's why people with celiac get the sensitivity to corn and get mm -hmm. the sensitivity to dairy and soy and all of that. And that's exactly what happened to me because then you kind of take all those in it's it's got to be moderation okay. and i know again that's very controversial not everybody agrees with that and it has their own success but in terms of what i practice and preach that seems to be the most success yeah no i mean it makes sense because when you're just if you're overdoing it with anything even exercise yeah. i mean you know it's yeah. never it doesn't end well yeah so i'm going to wrap this up because i know you and i have children to be picked up and clients to meet with and Yes. Lunch is, stuff. lunch is to be eaten. So yes. just how can people get in touch with you? Like, what are you up to? Anything new and exciting? Like what's, what's the, what's well, happening? You know what? I specialize in dealing with um, people with, you know, digestive issues. It doesn't have to be celiac, but I also um, am helping a lot of women that are just kind of in their forties or fifties and just not feeling great. I mean, that tends to be what I feel, feel like my main client is. And, um, you know, I, we start from the basics in terms of getting, going through their cabinets, going to the grocery store with them and just very simple steps. It's the whole process is very simple to change your health does not have to be life changing thing. And it should not also be like a BC and AD, like one day you're bad and the next day you're totally clean and righteous yeah. in terms of food. So that's what I work with. Um, and if people want to get in touch with me, they can go on my Facebook page, um, Burn Health and Wellness. Um, they can also reach out to me, message me on Facebook through Burn Health and Wellness or Pamela Asbury Burn. Okay. Um, you can also be, I can also be reached via email, Pam at Burn Health and Wellness, B-Y-R-N-E. Sounds good. Um, okay. So, and it was great having you. So. And great seeing you. Great. Hold on.